Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Wednesday the 8th of November. Now, several of the more serious news outlets in the United Kingdom are reporting on a high court case. This relates to the AstraZeneca vaccine and a specific side effect, the vaccine-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia, so where there is blood clots and where there are uh, low platelet levels. Of course, we know this was associated with several very serious adverse events in the UK. Now, this is probably the first of many cases, because surely it's only a matter of time until we see court cases related to other complications like myocarditis and pericarditis, like uh, excess menstruation and unexpected vaginal bleeding, anaphylaxis and other delayed hypersensitivity reactions, Guillain-Barre syndrome, Bell's palsy, capillary leak syndrome, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, thrombocytopenia, and even pregnancy-related adverse reactions. Are these all still to come? Complicated because of the indemnity that our governments rushed to give the vaccine manufacturers. But let's look at some of the detail on that now. Really quite fascinating and um, I think probably the shape of things to come. Uh, vindication uh, for those of us that have been asking questions for some time now is probably uh, just around the corner. Now, this is a landmark legal case. Oxford AstraZeneca COVID jab was defective, is the contention. 8th of November 2023, quite a few outlets. Um, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been branded as defective. Um, claims of efficacy were vastly, vastly overstated. And as we'll see, uh, th this is in fact the, the case. Uh, you could argue it was very va vastly overstated. High Court test case. Now, this is Mr. James Scott, who had a bleed on the brain, unfortunately. Uh, suffered a significant permanent brain injury, now unable to work, nearly died, in fact. Vaccinated on the uh, April 2021 and within a week or two he had this serious uh, blood clot. Now the claim is under the Consumer Protection Act, in in interestingly. So that's where this defective idea comes from. This defective idea is mentioned under the uh, Consumer uh, Protection Act that the vaccine was not what it uh, was um, proposed to be. In other words, it didn't quite have in the vial what it said on, on the tin is what this is arguing. Defective. This is the, uh, the way they're trying to get around the, the, the indemnity that the government gave them. But the government's going to probably end up paying for this. It's going to cost you and me a fortune, probably. Anyway, let's move on. Argues that uh, AstraZeneca vaccine was defective, not as safe as individuals were entitled to expect. So, Mr and Mrs Scott, we were told by the government that the vaccine was safe and effective, but what's happening to Jamie, that's Mr Scott, has been life-changing and their vaccine caused that. Pretty strong words. Uh, AstraZeneca vac uh, cannot continue to ignore the circumstances in which their vaccine has caused devastating injury and loss. Our legal case will seek to hold AstraZeneca to account, but we need to build a significant fighting fund to get justice. Um, vaccines, in fact, pretty well all justice in my country really is, is for those that can afford it. Um, you can't really bring a case in the high court unless you've got a lot of money behind you. But these individuals are presumably risking everything to do this. Um, second claim is from uh, Mrs. Uh, Alpa Taylor who was a 35, well, it's not from her, sadly, it's from her widower. Uh, an inquest confirmed that she was a vaccine-related serious adverse reaction. That particular serious adverse reaction. So there's two test cases here. And this could pave the way for uh, 80 damage claims, around about a million pounds each, um, related to vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and... Uh, thrombosis VIT. But Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency 
say at least 81 of these serious adverse reactions in the UK suspected to be linked to clotting and low platelets, but that's almost one in five of the suspected individuals suffered this particular severe adverse reaction. So at least five times more than that had a severe adverse reaction. And presumably these will be able to make claims uh, as well once this test case is established. And of course, once this test case is established, my understanding is there's going to be a group action and there's going to be a lot of people claiming, of course, once it's the precedent is accepted in the United Kingdom, is it going to be accepted in other countries as well? Um, this is probably the beginning of this potential landslide, to be quite honest. Uh, World Health Organization, uh, 13th of June 2022, the vaccine is safe and effective for all individuals uh, 18 and over. So um, that's what the World Health Organization said. It's in complete contradiction to the evidence being given in the High Court in the UK. And uh, of course, the World Health Organization is seeking incredible new powers under the International Health Regulations and the post-pandemic uh, treaty that we seem to be giving them. And yet this was the advice that they were giving. And this website there is dated as late as the 13th of June 2022. How could they possibly be saying this? How on earth could they be saying this? As late as the 13th of June 2022. Um, quite, um, well, I don't understand how the WHO could still be saying that. It's patently untrue. Um, AstraZeneca last night said to the Telegraph, patient safety is its highest priority. Very reassuring. Um, there, if I can pick up my piece of paper. Their vaccine. Uh, Vaxazavira. A vaccine has been shown to have an acceptable safety profile. I'm not quite sure who it's acceptable to, but presumably not the patients that were injured. Regulars, regulators around the world consistently state that the benefits of vaccination outweigh the risk of extremely rare potential side effects. Potential side effects? Well, no, these are actual side effects, actually. Um, these are actual side effects. And extremely rare is in the eye of the beholder. And But to be fair to AstraZeneca here... Um, the regulators, in my view, have completely let us down. I feel personally betrayed, as, and as I know many of you do. Now, many European countries, of course, banned the AstraZeneca at an early stage. Germany suspended its use in under 60s in March 2021. The UK stopped it for under 30s um, the month after, and for under 40s, uh, not until May 2021. Uh, but it carried on for a long time after that. Whereas Germany banned it in, in this group, and so did, from memory, Denmark and quite a few other countries. Freedom of Information Act, 148 payouts under the government vaccine damage scheme, 144 for AstraZeneca at £120,000 each. Why do we only know this as a result of freedom of information requests? Well, why can't people just be have an open and honest discussion about this why aren't i more free to talk about it now very very frustrating situation a whatsapp messages uh, again released to the telegraph uh, to or from matt hancock uh, there was concerns aired by the united states authorities that uh, it seems the government was aware of and of course astrazeneca never applied for a license in the united states now could it be that they thought they wouldn't get it so they didn't bother applying who knows? But they didn't. Uh, Sir John Bell, Professor of uh, Medicine at Oxford University, Government's Chief Advisor on Life Sciences, Advisor to the Joint Committee on Vaccination and, in, in, uh, Vaccination and Immunization. Again, WhatsApp messages. Uh, said AstraZeneca have become really frazzled. These are fairly contemporaneous messages as far as I understand. Uh, they accept that their comms are a bit clunky. <laughs> And uh, they misjudge some things like clinical trial data, right? So they, this is this is Sir John Bell, they misjudge some things like clinical trials data and manufacturing. How do you misjudge manufacturing? Partly because they've not done a vaccine before. Oh, well, if it's the first attempt. Quite incredible. Quite incredible. Right, legal arguments. 
Uh, no warning of the risk of vaccine-induced thrombosis and thrombocytopenia in the product information sheet at the time. AstraZeneca issued a press release following clinical trials saying that their vaccine was between 62 and 90% effective at preventing symptomatic COVID-19. In fact, the absolute risk reduction concerning COVID-19 prevention was only 1.2%. So they're saying that their relative risk reduction 62 to 90%. The absolute risk reduction, which is probably more useful in the real world, 1.2%. If we'd been told this at the time, we know we've got a new vaccine here, it's 1.2% effective in terms of absolute risk. Doesn't sound quite as effective as 60 to 90%, does it? Not quite. Not quite. Uh, and that, and that, and that, that one point two percent is from the Prescriptions Medicines Code of Practice Authority. Check them out for yourself. Lawyers to examine government reassurance. Secretary of State for Health, uh, an accompanying department minute, said this: the data so far on this vaccine suggests that there will be no adverse reactions and so no liability. There are no drugs or vaccines that work that have no adverse events. Maybe we need more doctors, nurses, pharmacists in government rather than career politicians. Because to say that uh, there will be no adverse events, I mean, no, I mean, no, no is an awfully big word, isn't it? Sarah Moore, one of the uh, legal representatives for the uh, injured the group of individuals whom we represent have always been clear. They do not dabble in anti-vaccine conspiracy theories. Excellent. Pleased to hear it. However, it is plainly factually inaccurate to claim the vaccines do no harm, given the experience of our client group, the vaccine injured and bereaved. Well, of course, they, they are injured and bereaved. Of course, um, it does damage. AstraZeneca made the point that... Um, Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency are granted full marketing approval for the UK base on the safety profile and vac uh, for efficacy of the vaccine. Um, so answers, questions to be asked of AstraZeneca, of the regulatory authorising authorities and of the government of the time quite significant questions all around really but the point is this is probably the first case and we're going to see a lot more i strongly suspect uh, with the pfizer and with the pfizer vaccine particularly um the reason that the indemnity indemnity might not apply is that um the vaccine manufacturing process used for the vaccine in the clinical trials um was nearly entirely different from the vaccine manufacturing process used for the vaccine rollout so it's quite possible to argue that it's two different products i think there was roughly only about two to three hundred vaccines of the what we, what we call the, uh, the the manufacturing process two that were used in the trial all the rest were manufacturing process one which was a completely different technology so uh, the vaccine that was trialed is arguably a different product from the vaccine that sadly uh, I was uh, given, and many of you were given. Now, just before we finish, the BBC um, televised Andrew Bridgen's speech that we covered in Parliament um, about uh, excess deaths. And uh, here's the BBC for you site. Uh, isn't it nice to know the BBC is for us? Very, uh, very warming concept, isn't it? This was released on the 3rd of November. We've reviewed our use of on-screen captions, which were all over the place during an adjournment debate in the House of Commons, trends in excess deaths. Uh, they, uh, there were concerns, yes, there were, that the captions which outlined the NHS guidelines on vaccines for COVID and other diseases showed a bias against Mr Budgeon MP. Well, a few paranoid people might have got that idea just because there was these banners plastered all over the place talking about the official advice that might have contradicted the points being made by Mr Bridgen. <sighs> he was making the speech. It's normal practice to provide accurate information 
Shouldn't we, so, we should be so grateful, shouldn't we, that we're getting this accurate information <clears throat> and context in these debates on screen? In these cases, it was an important aspect of our coverage due to the nature of the assertions being made to the public uh, in relation to public health. Was it really? However, we accept that there was a lack of consistency in our use of these cons uh, captions. And that the number posted during the speech was not proportionate nor always relevant. Which created an impression, which created the incorrect impression that there was an editorial approach in relation to the views expressed. So if you watched all those banners that the BBC put on Mr Bridgen's speech and you got the impression, you got the impression that there was an editorial approach, that the BBC were taking a particular position, you were wrong. Your impression was wrong. The BBC tell us here quite clearly uh, that uh, it would give me an incorrect impression. And I don't want members of the public arguing with the BBC because a lot of these people are BAs in journalism. If you got the incorrect impression, your problem. <clears throat> Which, create, which created the incorrect impression that there was an editorial approach in relation to the views expressed. So it appears the BBC has no editorial approach. And then finally, 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 we apologise. What was that, BBC? We apologise for this and are reviewing the way we use captions in such proceedings. So is that an apology or not? You know, to tell you the truth, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but we'll leave it there. You can make your own mind up. If it was an incorrect... Uh, if you got the impression that uh, there was a particular editorial approach, uh, it was incorrect. There we go. We'll leave it there. I, I don't tell you what to think. Uh, you, you make up your own mind. And uh, thank you for watching.